this is sort of a, a celebration today of, of projects that have, are starting, but also projects that have come much further along uh, and are starting to make impact out in the real world. Um, so uh, to begin with, uh, we will have uh, Chris Thoreson uh, give the first talk uh, about the Human Ops Project. And, and this is a very uh, special project for Katia, being sort of the, the biggest uh, single project uh, that was undertaken by Katia. It's a European project led by Katia, led by Chris Thoreson. Uh, and this project completed uh, last year. Uh, so uh, we are now sort of reaping the, the rewards of this work, and we'll see the, so the glimpse of, of what will come after this uh, in uh, Chris's discussion about uh, the results. So I think I'll uh, give the microphone over to Chris right now, and he will continue with uh, talking about human ops, uh, and then we'll continue from there. And each talk will take about 20 minutes, and we will open for maybe at least a couple of questions after each talk. Some of you may have already seen some of what I will tell you about. Um, I decided, since it's uh, only about 20 minutes uh, of time, that I should give you uh, the 10,000 foot view of the project. Uh, I know that um, uh, we kind of owe you longer in-depth sessions, and somehow uh, this keeps getting put off. And partly it's because we're still working on writing uh, what amounts to about eight 30-page papers to describe in detail what we did in this project. So uh, you'll have to forgive me that the in-depth material will not really be available till this fall. The um, long-term goal of this work is to develop an artificial general intelligence. What does that mean? Well, it turns out that the field of AI has evolved in a particular way to focus on isolated problems and uh, producing solutions that perhaps don't push the boundary of, of uh, technology much more than, say, a traditional computer science project might. So we constantly have this question, you know, why is this called AI and not just computer science? And um, I think although I won't go deep into that question, answering that question here, I think you will have a glimpse of an answer for that question after this presentation. Because machines right now are lot, a lot less smart than, uh, they're a lot dumber than Hollywood wants us to believe and journalists wants us to believe and even AI researchers want us to believe because we're all competing for, for grant money and so we uh, want to make the claims that our technology and ideas are the best. Um, what results is sometimes a bit of an inflation in, in the results. Now, um, I have a particular pet theory about why there's a delay in AI progress, and um, it has to do with methodology and the um, underlying uh, assumptions. And it turns out that, in, in our view, the current programming paradigms cannot support the phenomenon of cognitive development. Now, you, you, know, what, you know this concept from your own childhood when you grow from uh, a newborn to a fully grown human being, you go through cognitive development. That's what it is. Um, it's not just the knowledge that you acquire that, that changes over time. It's also the processes in your brain that change with the knowledge. And because to, to support cognitive development, the architecture must grow. And to, for the architecture to grow, it must be capable of self-observation. It must be able to measure its own progress towards particular milestones in its cognitive development. And all present programming languages have been made for fully grown AIs. So you get a paradox if you try to use them to develop the very thing that is required for using them. So it's really all about methodology. We have our own methodology called Constructivist AI. And um, it's based on principles of self-construction at the core and principles of seed design, because if you want self-construction, uh, well, you have to start with something. We are not tabula rasa, like a 
the philosophers once claimed. We have produced uh, an architecture, which is uh, an AGI aspiring architecture, as we like to call it. And uh, it's capable of general purpose learning in dynamic worlds. And it's domain independent. Now, that part of my claims still remains to be somewhat uh, demonstrated. Um, I will show you an example of uh, what we have, of the evaluation that we've done so far. And it's certainly not the, uh, the only uh, or the, the end of the evaluation of this technology because we have still a lot of work to do on that front. But the, the initial results are very promising. Now, ERA, this architecture, demonstrates transversal cognitive skills at multiple levels of granularity and abstraction, which means that it's capable of system-wide learning. Uh, learning is essentially all throughout the architecture. Um, it's everywhere. It has temporal grounding to a level that we have not yet seen in any um, whole you know, software architecture, i.e. it learns what time means. Um, it can observe and imitate real-time, real real-world complex events, as I'll show you. Uh, it has attention, or, or the beginnings of one, inference, abstraction, and, and more. We claim that this is a really a new kind of AI, it, and it possibly the beginning of a new phase in uh, how we think about self-programming. Because the system acquires knowledge autonomously, starting from observation with a very small seed uh, that's hand-coded by, by the designers. And this knowledge that is acquired is honed through abduction and induction that are continuously running as part of the system's uh, operation. Self-modeling is inherent in the system. It's always learning. It never stops uh, to recompile or, or, or uh, uh, garbage collect or anything like that. And as I've mentioned, the learning is domain independent. How did we achieve this? <coughs> well, um, it's not just a single trick. You've seen maybe in the recent literature, or literature I should say, yeah, some partly in the literature, but also especially in the public media about deep learning and how this is based on a principle of a single cognitive operation or algorithm. Well, uh, I definitely do not subscribe to that theory that uh, you can explain intelligence through a single algorithm or, or anything remotely close to a single, you know, a handful or a dozen. No, it really requires a lot of rethinking, in our opinion. Um, and I mentioned already the programming language, <coughs> the current programming language is not being sufficient. Well, we designed our own called Replicode that's based on self-reflection and self-organization. These are core principles for reasoning and logic in the system, and we're not uh, numerically based like the artificial neural net people uh, or Bayesian uh, theorists for that matter. We're really symbolic, um, uh, we're building a symbolic uh, representation. We use ampliative reasoning, which is a very powerful combination of abduction and induction. Now, for this, we need a new programming paradigm, and it needs to be reflective uh, based on the notion of seed programming. So you, you create a seed from which the system self bootstraps. On top of this, we have developed the cognitive architecture that I already mentioned called ERA, autocatalytic endogenous reflective architecture. And at the very top, it's all driven by this fundamentally different methodology, constructivist AI. Now, this is in fact uh, inspired by, in part, Piaget's theory of cognitive development, but not in a very strict sense at all. Yeah, good on time. Um, the hard thing about explaining ERA is that every process is distributed um, 
or, or I should say, every function is distributed via several interacting processes. And you can, you can take many views on the system, but this is one view that we're very fond of because it um, pulls out the fundamental difference in this architecture from other architectures that um, it's, it's sort of mutually self-sustaining in so many ways. Um, the, um, the working space is essentially, um, I mean, the, the majority of the system at runtime is, uh, is models. And these models are dynamically reorganized and reshuffled uh, continuously as the system is running. And um, the models essentially allow the system to make predictions uh, about how to achieve its goals. Now, the goals are essentially, there are, uh, there's a small set of goals given by the programmers, and all other goals are derived based on the available knowledge and sub, uh, and sub goals and acquired, acquired models. And you can think of this as, you know, uh, the attention mechanism is essentially steering the use of the resources of the system. And through um, the observation of the environment and the effects and the difference between its own predictions and, and uh, its current models, it revises the models continuously, improving the predictions keeping the models that work better, and so on. Um, and through this operation, you essentially get for free planning and learning. A bit more detailed breakdown. I'm not going to go into this uh, diagram in too much detail, but basically you can see here how the, um, the, the many functions in the system are sort of distributed throughout. And a lot of it's mediated Essentially, a significant part is mediated via these models. These models are very small code snippets, essentially. They uh, accumulate into uh, assemblies, which can be hierarchical, and uh, for predicting bigger things, bigger phenomena, and uh, longer time horizons. Um, uh, and because we want this architecture, systems develop, using, developed using this architecture, we want these systems to be capable of figuring out what kind of knowledge they need. Now, of course, that's not completely unbounded. We don't build a system like this uh, and say, you know, we have no idea whether it's going to be underwater or underground or in the air. You know, it's not that extreme. But the basic idea is given, say, some sort of physical embodiment, like, OK, it's got four wheels, or six wheels, or six legs. Um, we want it to be able to, to the extent that its physical in incarnation is, is capable of, survive whether it is dropped into the Amazon forest or on the surface of Mars. So essentially, the kind of diversity that we have humans have every day when we go uh, you know, outside for a walk in the forest or sit in our car to drive home, etc. There's, um, there's a lot of different environments that we just very easily can handle. So if I, ha if I uh, want to show you snippets from the videos, I'm going to have to run pretty quickly. Interestingly enough, most of the system is designed in a fractal-like way. So any major function in the system looks essentially like the architecture itself. This is essential because um, in order for the system to be able to inspect itself at a very granu small granularity, um, the mechanisms for self-inspection are in inherently encoded in the programming language itself. And so once you've achieved this at one level of detail, at the lowest level of detail, of course it doesn't change as, as you go up. You know, the fact that uh, the system is inspecting a particular, um, let's say, model is not that much different from the system inspecting uh, a, a, a subcomponent or assembly at a higher level. To evaluate the system, we have essentially created a uh, an automated interviewer that can interview humans in cyberspace. 
it works like this. Um, S1 observes two humans in an interview in cyberspace. It learns how to conduct the interview. It can take either role, and then it demonstrates its skills, acquired skills, in an interview with a human. Diagrammatically, it looks like this. You've got two humans talking in front of computers with the face of the other on their screen. So the speech is going from a microphone to the other, other person's headphones, and vice versa. And the video, or actually we're tracking people with, uh, with body trackers, um, the, the movement of the humans are actually transferred to, to an avatar that the other person sees. So it's sort of like a video conference, but with avatars mimicking the movements of the other. And ERA is sitting there as one watching this all. Um, I won't have much time for videos, so I will run very quickly through this. And you can, you can look at the videos in more detail on the website. But basically, uh, in order to tell you what the system knows at the beginning of an interview, I'll, I, I give you this list. Essentially, um, there's a lot of differences between this and typical systems like that. I mean, you could achieve what we have done in HumanOps if you just gave the system much more domain knowledge. But what we have given is words, but no grammar. Um, actions or atomic actions like grab, release, point at, and look at. And these are just defined as geometric linear algebra, basically, in the cyberspace. Stopping the interview uh, clock ends the session. That's like an interview ends when you stop the interview clock. Um, objects, glass bottle, plastic bottle, a few types of objects. They have human readable labels on them, as given here. Uh, the properties of objects, Madoff, uh, the role of interviewer and interviewee. The role of interviewer is to get the interviewee to speak. The role of interviewee is to please the interviewer. Um, and then we have a very, and, and there's, you can see the models for the interviewer and interviewee. This is it. Um, you can see the actual code underlying this ontology um, in our tech reports. And what is learned, and uh, normally I would show you the video and then go through what actually has been learned, but we'll do it in a more quick way right now. Um, so the general principles of an interview. Of course, you did not see that in the given list. That is, you ask a question. And uh, it, as an interviewer, you ask a question, and then you listen to the, to the answer, and then you ask another question. As an interviewee, you answer the topic relevant question of the, que of the uh, interviewer. So, and also movements. Um, Multimodal coordination and joint action. For example, uh, if, if you pick up something and you say, what is this? It, the, the this resolves to the object that you're holding. Uh, as well as gaze. Um, and then <clears throat> that the interviewer asks a series of questions until the, the clock stops, etc. So let me give you a quick view. A recycled aluminum can costs 95% less than a new one. Which takes more energy to make, an aluminum can or a plastic bottle? It takes more energy to produce a can of aluminum than a plastic bottle. Which takes more energy to make, an aluminum can or a glass bottle? Less energy is needed to produce a can of aluminum than a glass bottle. Which releases more What is this object? So this is the kind of interaction that you see in the videos. And here is the um, uh, let's see. This is S1 after about 20 hours of observation of that kind of interaction. So here the machine is interviewing the human. Tell us about this object. This is a glass bottle. 
Glass can be recycled by grinding into filler. Most glass bottle releases more grip, which releases more greenhouse gases when produced. A glass bottle or plastic bottle. Making a glass bottle releases. And the production of words and the movements and everything is, is essentially modeled auto automatically by the system based on its observation of, of the two humans. Uh, plus some interaction with uh, with the human, uh, amounting to roughly uh, 20 hours. Um, the number of models, to, to give you an indication here, um, in this system you have 600 good models and 800 bad models. Now the bad models need to be stored because we don't want the system to continuously regenerate bad models. It needs to know what it's done before and what hasn't worked. Um, but this runs on a laptop with four cores, so we have very high hopes of scaling this up. And uh, since the system is designed essentially um, uh, domain independent, the, um, we have every reason to believe that um, applying this system to other uh, to other uh, domains is going to work just fine. Uh, I think I'll stop there and. Um, if you have a few questions, maybe one or two, we have time. Yeah. You mentioned that the system, of course, generates bad models. So uh, can, can you explain in a couple of words I mean, what is the process by which the system decides what is good and what is bad? Uh, that's very simple. Essentially, it's always doing predictions, and it's doing predictions into uh, predefined horizon that in fact we have it's one of the few things that is hand tuned in the system um, we have defined that for dialogue we need a certain amount into the future of prediction uh, I forget exactly what it is in this but it's a few seconds up to maybe uh, 15 seconds or so so the system is always is using the models to produce predictions and then it compares the predictions to reality it picks the best predictions um, the best, best options, the ones that get the closest to achieving its goals uh, to execute and then it executes them. If, if there's a big divergence between reality and the predictions, it throws away the models and tries a new. So it needs to keep the old model and say, okay, that didn't work. I'll make a new model and see if that works. And, and it's just co completely baked into the system, how the system operates. I mean, it, the whole efficiency issue is built around this idea. So when the system generates a new model, do we always check whether it's, in some sense, already there in the store of yeah. bad models? Yeah. yeah. There, it's hugely inefficient for a linear computer scientist to think about this. The only way to really uh, grasp this and the power of it is to think about biological systems and how much of parallel processing they are always doing. It's the only way. If you think, you know, okay, I'm going to be uh, as efficient as a computer graphics person to simulate trees and so on with, with uh, tricks like fractal geometry, and, and instead of actually making the model for the pine needles, you know, forget it. It's, it's not going to work. So it's, it's really based on a fundamentally parallel thinking. There are two questions. The first two, in terms of filters, like what information you gave the system beforehand, and then what it was able to learn. Is there like a well-defined way of providing like these knowledge or or or, or and goals? So you could just be given a different kind of problem, or like is this a, a um, or is it just hard to do? The question is, uh, do we have a nicely defined methodology for providing the initial knowledge, right? Uh, no. The, uh, we can see how this will happen and can happen, but uh, we, the system just hasn't been around long enough so that we have a very nicely defined, honed methodology. I mean, take, take any new, you know, fairly different programming language. When it first arrives on the scene, people really haven't figured out 
what are the best, uh, you know, uh, patterns and so on. So, so it's really like that. So that's somewhere you would like to go, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the second question is like, uh, so it's, it's just working with words, there's no entry to a grammar and, and things like that. And, and, and then it's watching and evaluating yourself if you're doing the right thing. But isn't this just some type of a uh, road learning? You just imitate what you see without being able to generalize the concepts or and apply them in a wider sense? It does generalization through um, essentially uh, um, model value replacement. So it, it sees a pattern of some sort, like a sequence of words, and it sees another pattern, um, but, the, but the result is the same. It assumes that this, these are two, model, two ways of getting to the same goal. It, it can fuse the thing, so it, it essentially can build a higher level model that combines them both, that, or that contains them both in a more general version with free variables. That could be with slots that could be filled. So, for example, pointing is really a, a really nice model that says if you point at something at the same time, you know, and this is after it's observed, you know, if you point at something at the same time as you say uh, this, then use the point at uh, method to resolve which object and, and fill the slot in the sequence of words with the name of that object which is in some slot on the... So it's really looking at patterns. I mean, it's, it's really pattern-driven. And now the question is really just how far can we get in making the system more powerful at generalizing these patterns and observing patterns and inventing new patterns and so on. And I think, you know, this could go a long way to, for example, answer how analogies can be done and so on. We're not there yet, but we can see how it could be done. Yes. So, could you apply uh, some traditional learning algorithms, like uh, neural networks or something like that, to solve similar types of What's this tool? You can use this system to solve problems that no other method can solve. Uh, there's an overlap, of course. It's sub it subsumes a lot of what's been done before. There is some, uh, there are some things that this probably cannot do, or there's a higher cost of using this method. And, but we really haven't had too much time to explore sort of the pros and cons in that respect. But we're, it's pre fairly obvious. There's no system on the planet that can do this except this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.